Well, good evening and welcome to our Rams post-draft show, night number two. Hope you're having a great weekend, everyone. Thank you for spending part of it with us. I'm JB, along with my broadcast partner, Maurice Jones-Drew, and the general manager of your Los Angeles Rams, Les Snead. We're in the SoFi Draft Lab, and the Rams came into this night with three picks on day two. They ended up making three selections. We'll go into each of those. But, Les, you also added a fourth-round pick, which I know is important, and you upgraded a six by nearly a full round into the fifth. So, poise for day three. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Really looking forward to tomorrow with the, the nine picks. I think you mentioned it. We were we were hoping at some point we, we nicknamed it the black hole where we really – our last pick in the third round all the way to wherever we picked in the fifth, there was no picks. Uh, but so we like to at least, you know, put a little pinpoint right in between there and, and see what we can do with it. And and we're really jacked about the day. Uh, you never know how it's going to play out, uh, even when you when you go to 36, because you you, you just know that hey, there's going to be quality players that's taken right before you, and and as you wait to the third round, so you gotta you gotta rely on your board. And at the end of the day, you spend a lot of time right putting that board together, and it's really just a map to help help you navigate uh, the draft as it evolves and, and as there's, you know, there's definitely, uh, let's call it volatility along the way. Now you're talking about that, that black hole spot, that, that part where there wasn't a pick. Was this something that you knew a couple months from that, a couple months ago, or was it last week, or was it something that you kind of just planned on today? How did you go about really developing the strategy to try to fill that hole and getting some picks there in that area where you guys didn't have picks? Well, we, we, I think it, it, it initially started – well, number one, there's a – we nicknamed it the black hole for a reason because, wow, there's a, a void right. there and you'd know you would sit there tomorrow and go, wow, I wish we would have had a pick here. Also, knowing that when we started the whole thing and we're picking 36, usually when you're picking early in the second round, a lot of teams like to move up. You just got to be willing to go back and usually you can recruit you know, maybe a late third – or, or a fourth rounder, and it, and it, and it ended up working out that we were able to to do that along the way with with a couple with at least one of our third rounders. So, all right, let's start at 36 there with uh, Steve Avila, an interior offensive lineman by way of TCU. And Les, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is a bigger offensive lineman than the Rams have employed, deployed recently. It kind of takes me back to the Roger Saffold era Rams on the interior of the offensive line. Definitely, you know that was that was that was a part of it. Uh, you know, it was definitely an opportunity to add, let's call it a little more girth, a little more width, a uh, little more weight, a little more power. But what was very important, in, in especially how our offense, how Sean, his staff, likes to call plays, like to design plays, like to attack defenses, there is an element where there's still got to be some movement skills. Some movement skills. You can't just be big. That's a more – there's a lot of schemes like that. Uh, that are, let's call it, more gap schemes, Baltimore and things like that, and it definitely works, just not what we do. So it was very important for us to try to say, you know what, can we add, let's call it like it is, large, strong man that can move a little bit. <laughs> you know, as a running back, uh, you got to love big men that love the block, right? And and to have a guy like that, he has some versatility as well where he can move to center or play the other guard. Was that part of the process too, and signing him that he can kind of move anywhere in the interior of the line? Definitely. That versatility is very important. Uh, we've had, we had volatility last year with injuries at center, so that's that's one thing uh, that's important. We so we're going to bring him in and, and and find a spot for him. But the neat thing is, you do know he can play two guards in a center spot. Uh, that just makes you definitely more valuable. And we'll try to figure out the best five and go from there. I know I'm looking way too far into the future, but before we get to 77 and the Rams' next selection. Is it fair? Are you okay with the interpretation of today's first move and really the overall picture of day two being a vote of confidence in the longevity of Matthew Stafford's prime and how many more years and touchdowns he can contribute to the Los Angeles Rams? Definitely a vote of confidence in, right, with, with Matthew being a pocket passer. Uh, the more time we can give him, uh, the more deadly he can be. So we're jacked. He's had a really good spring. He's feeling really, really good. And, and I, I would – I would say to the fans, it's pretty easy. Just go back to when he was healthy and some of the dimes and darts he he has thrown. Uh, that's what we're banking on. And I can tell you, you know, as he's been throwing this off season, it looks very similar or even better because he has he's had a lot of rest. But the the neat thing is, like you said, he he is a pocket passer, has a, has some mobility in there. But being going back to let's call it the old New Orleans Saints days, they had these two large guards. 
and it, Drew Brees was able to sit back there, you know, you, and he could step up, and right. you just really, really couldn't push the pocket, and that was kind of a vision. Day two saw two fairly big name quarterbacks come off the board. Were the Rams in business for a quarterback today? In any you know, serious we, we always felt that those two would go uh, probably ahead of where we would be comfortable picking. In that, like you just mentioned, we wanted to help Matthew Stafford out and do that with players that are going to play 60, 65 plays a game, and also on defense, players that are going to you know help get Matthew the ball back. And then, and at that point, we'll we'll figure out who's going to be his number two as it goes on. Yeah, the, the trenches, it seemed like uh, day two was kind of about it. What would you like from uh, Byron Young out of Tennessee? You know, it, it that's a, it's a really neat story. And out of high school, uh, didn't sign with anyone. Uh, kid loved football, but for whatever reason, ended up working Dollar General oh. uh, for for a year, maybe two. Ended up then walking on uh, at, a, at a junior college in Georgia. And at the end of the day, he ends up getting to Tennessee and, uh, right, making the most of that opportunity. So th- th- there's a story there that, wow, this guy was hungry, had a dream, didn't go so well early, didn't fold, didn't melt, <laughs> kept kept finding a way, and then went to Tennessee. And, and I, I think I mentioned it earlier, mom, dad, God gave him some nice juice. He's a 250-pound man that ran a 4440 at the at the combine. So you, you can feel him when he comes off the ball. So. Reminds me of Kobe Durant in that way, in terms of his backstory and the narrative standing out in terms of your selection. Why does that matter when separating an individual football player? I know what he does on Saturdays is your primary interest, but why does that help make a decision like he made tonight easier, more convincing? I, I think it, if you choose uh, to play in the NFL, I know you've been a part. You can attest to this. That's trying to do something that's <laughs> – that's trying to be good or great. And there's going to be an element of stress and drudgery to actually trying to achieve good or greatness in this league. So when you do see players, right, go through real stress, real adversity, it lets you know that, you know what, they're going to be able to handle some of the incoming traffic of of playing in this league because this isn't uh, an easy profession to choose. Uh, It's probably very rewarding, especially, you know, but at the end of the day, there is an element of stress and drudgery that you're going to go through and, a lot of these kids proven they can handle it. Well, the, it seemed like the trenches in day two was kind of what you guys were focusing on. Was that just because of all the injuries last year, or is that something you guys kind of wanted to revamp uh, from the years prior? Well, it's it's prob- it's a little bit of both injuries, but we've you know we've lost a few players uh, in free agency, right. uh, so we're definitely going to have to replenish both sides of the line. We like we we usually call it a front five situation. Uh, and it can go to four in known passing downs. But, you know, adding that element of juice, and we probably hadn't gotten to, you know, our, our last pick of the third round. But there was an intent there. He has – he's he's built similarly to Aaron Donald and has a, a very similar style game where there is a an element of, of get off right now in a short area that can give him an advantage on the OL and get an edge. So you're, you're, you're visioning in a four-man – right. Front and known uh, passing situations, those two guys as missiles inside. Uh, and uh, and we talked about Byron. That, that speaks for yourself, you know, being able to add legit gas off the edge. You're talking about uh, Kobe Turner, defensive tackle, last stop, Wake Forest at pick uh, number 89 there. And you mentioned a, cu- a few key points there. One, Aaron Donald, whose name we've yet to – to surface and I think it bears asking what he makes of everything that's happened with the 2023 Los Angeles Rams especially when you add to his dog work room you know uh, I know he's texted with Ra and Sean and and he was definitely jacked about these two players I I think he's even probably uh uh I know for a fact he's he's studied Kobe a little bit because they have a similar game and 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 with uh you know Eric Henderson uh, I think they probably did a little partnering their collaboration and, and Aaron, uh, Aaron's a fan. I mentioned it downstairs in a press conference, chatting when they were in this off season about kind of, hey, here's the plan, here's the vision, here's what we're going to have to do right in, in 2023. And, and, and part of that was going to be a less experienced defense. And uh, Aaron looked at all of us in the room. He said, you know what, I'm fine with that. Just make sure these young guys care. And both uh, Byron and Kobe – Definitely care. 
Now, I have to ask you for all the people that are fantasy GMs or Madden GMs, is it as stressful in that room as it is when I'm on the game and I'm waiting to get my guy and I'm trying to move up and move down and then someone takes your guy? Oh, it's definitely uh, – it's interesting because you're going to go through emotions of – and uh, you know, throughout the draft where you – inevitably, right, you're going to go, okay, this is our favorite. And, and you start doing it a little too early. I always go, hey, we're jinxing ourselves. You may be eight <laughs> picks out. Eight picks out, this is our – now you have to have a plan, but the plan's really on the board. But at the end of the day, you're going to, okay, this is our favorite, and this is our second favorite, and this is our third. And then all of a sudden, inevitably, a few times in the draft, your favorite's going to go. Oh. And, and you got to get over the – right. It's, it, it, I call it in football, it's like a DB getting beat deep. Guess what? You got – Beat deep might have been played 14 in the game, but you might have, you know, let's call it 55, right. 60 more plays to play. So get over it and make the most of it. Especially on a night like tonight when you're trading back, right? The uh, interpretation there is there might be someone we really like, but if we're accepting this deal, we're going to live with the potential consequence of not being able to make that individual a Ram. Th that's definitely the case. Hmm. And First, a lot of times on that too, there's there's a, there's there especially in the third round too. It's not like it's you have these pods of players that oh we'd like them all to be Rams and it's really hard to really say oh this is going to be the best player right? right that's I mean can we predict that probably so it's hard to break those ties so when there is a puddle of players that we all like you're like wait a minute we might can use this as an op to get uh, more draft capital and then let's just say there's eight players there you may lose four of those but we liked eight so you end up uh letting the draft make the some of the decisions for you less a lot of us noticed that again uh, tonight your first couple of picks were senior bowl participants and i'm curious for a updated perspective on why those data points seem to be so convincing for you and your team it, you know it's the, the 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 neat thing about the senior bowl and and let's take uh uh let's let's take uh, steve on the ol the College schemes are different uh, than the NFL, and some are a little bit closer. But at the end of the day, he played in a in a in a in a, in a wide open spread scheme. So when you see the players go to the Senior Bowl, there is an element of seeing them now, right? Uh, let's call it uh, adjust to right. evolve during the course of a week when they know everybody's out. There's an element of pressure there, right? A lot of NFL. Everybody's going to watch this tape because guess what? You're probably going to line up against other players on the other side of the ball in practice and in the game that are going to get that are going to get called on either day one or day two, or day three of this draft. So there's an element of competition there. But the neat thing with a, a offensive lineman is okay. Wait a minute. He went from a more spread style to a more spread. So now he is in the run game, pass game, protecting. Uh, let's call it blocking in the run game more like an NFL team would do. So it, it definitely helps that. So being able to see them compete against uh, good competition, uh, and especially on a day-to-day -day basis, like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever the days are, they wake up and know, okay, because every single play, this isn't one of those practices, okay, we're getting ready for a game. Right. So let's go 60% or 70 and let's be ready on Sunday. <laughs> every single day is somebody's trying to impress someone. So it's very uh, – intense, stressful week, so it's neat to be able to evaluate those In those steps. practices, do you take, like, nine on seven, the run drill more important, or is it like the – you know, we've seen the Rams do a group pass where you have, like, games versus the O-line, or is it the one-on-ones? Where do you really see where you can kind of take what he did in college and translate it to the NFL and those types of drills? It's funny. Uh, we do different ways. I – it's it's interesting. One on ones, I usually call it the putting ring. I'm like, why are we watching this guy on the putting ring or, or driving range? I right. want to see those guys, you know, walk down the fairway at Augusta on Sunday. I don't want to see them warm up, you know, before the lights and cameras on. But there is some elements where you can get from each uh, the one on ones. Hey, a receiver releasing. How how far? How raw is he? How far? or how much do you have to teach him to, to be a better releaser in the NFL? Because it's going to get harder in the NFL, things like that. But probably personally, I'm more let's get let's, let's, let's get to the 11 on 11. Let's watch him in the orchestra, not necessarily practicing the drums in their garage. Last one for me as we look ahead to day three where the Rams will have nine more selections at the outset of Saturday. Les, this was regarded as a historically good draft for tight ends. My first part of the question is, did you agree with that assessment? And given the run on tight ends that we've seen so far in this draft, is there depth extending into day three at that position? Yeah, I think it was, I think the depths 
there it's it's still uh extended into day three but i think we i think you uh saw it at the end of the end of the first round you know dalton was taken out of utah uh and then heck right opening bell uh two tight ends go and, and we probably if you're in football if you're an evaluator you definitely expected that those two players you know iowa and notre dame would go pretty soon and and definitely Oregon State, Mr. Musgrave. A lot of Pac-12ers here. Yeah, man, it's good for us. <laughs> All right, MJD, thank you for uh, showing up to the Rams Draft Lab here, the SoFi Draft I, Lab. I good to see you, buddy. Here. Good to see you, nice too. Nice to connect with you. Good luck with the rest of your draft weekend. And, uh, Les Snead, I know a busy day upcoming for the Los Angeles Rams as well. We'll be back here tomorrow for more post-draft coverage. Uh, head coach Sean McVay will be our guest. Looking forward to uh, the picks in rounds four through seven. Again, the Rams started with 11. Now they're up to 12, having taken three here tonight. There's no way he's going to remember all nine names. Hope you have it written down. Sean? Tomorrow. Yeah. Maybe he could. He's got a good memory. I mean, you doubt Sean's better write memory down is kind of the, the call of the night. <laughs> That's a heck of a day. <laughs> they must be swimming through your brain. I don't know how you can keep them all straight. I, you know what? I, it's interesting if I said a story that I sh probably shouldn't tell the tale, but a lot of times I forget names. Oh, yeah. Because if you see the draft board – like you can see right here, you know, Mr. Battle from Alabama. But usually I'm like, oh, it's A-L-U-N-9. And I know that's school code, right? The first two uh, initials is state. Right. Then the second two is, let's call it University of Alabama. But you're so used to watching them play football on film. So I'm like, okay, somebody mentions me, hey, how do you like so-and-so in the draft? I'm like, I need a, I need a school and a, a number. School position and number. Like, oh yeah, he's that guy. He's really good. You learn so. the name when they get here and they start making plays for you. The great thing you about being you. here at the SoFi Draft Lab is, no matter what room you're in, what wall you're looking at, there's always a flat screen to remind you of uh, exactly. I all see of those Sam links. Franz tied in. I mean, the, the nicknames I've given him, it, I'm bad with it. It's hey, I've called him Latutu. <laughs> I mean, it, all day long. So, Cameron Latu, I think. I'm good with names, but he's definitely been Latutu for me. All right, Rams have their 2-2. Now San Francisco, a division rival, adding one of their own here in 23. Les, thanks for stopping by. It's great to see you. Good luck on uh, day three. We know there's a lot of great opportunity for the Rams to uh, add to their roster as we get ahead to the offseason program. Appreciate MJD, that. be well. I'm J.B. Long. Thank you for joining us on this Rams post-draft show.